Okay, uh, so just like the first day, I was being a little bit slow. Uh, yesterday, mainly because, of course, I had to uh, finish up the first day's lecture. So today I have to finish up the second day's lecture. And just remember the final thing we talked about yesterday, that was this so-called matter of power spectrum that we can probe, in principle at least, using galaxy surveys. So we saw that uh, seemingly super... Okay, let's see. If... Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Take some time. To okay. Put in yep. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, you can take all this data, and you can from that calculate, for example, the two-point correlation function of points. Then you can convert it to Fourier space, and you can get this so-called matter power spectrum out. And here is an example from a relatively recent galaxy survey. And I think what I tried to emphasize yesterday was that we can actually nowadays measure this quite precisely to just a few percent precision. So it's actually quite impressive over a wide range of scales going out to physical scales corresponding to many hundreds of megaparsec. And we saw this. I'll just skip it today. I, yeah. And I think this was the final figure, right? So the takeaway message is that neutrinos have a very profound influence actually on large scale structure in the form of, for example, this meta power spectrum. And as one of you asked yesterday, that, that seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because neutrinos make up so little of the energy density of the universe. But because of this metric feedback on the formation of dark matter, it actually, uh, has a much larger effect than you would naively expect, right? So not, not only do neutrinos not contribute to the matter to the matter clustering, but they also inhibit the clustering of matter because you simply have less matter around and the universe is expanding uh, faster than in a model that just had a reduced amount of matter. And in the end, you get a quite large effect, which by now should have been visible had it not been for the fact that of course, in cosmology, there are many, many parameters that all go into this composite spectrum, and you have to measure all of them simultaneously. That's the bad thing about cosmology in that sense. Okay, so uh, the other type of observation that we can and do use is the cosmic microwave background. Of course, there are many other cosmological observables, but this is the only other one I'll talk about. And just very briefly, what we do is uh, sort of the same thing. We try to compress data. What we're really measuring, of course, from the raw data is a temperature anisotropy. So it's basically an anisotropy living on a spherical surface. And therefore, we can compose it. If we have access to the full sky, we can decompose it into a set, a set of orthonormal functions, the YLM functions. That's not exactly how it plays out because we have incomplete sky coverage and so on, but sort of the gist of it. Now, these ALM coefficients can be used then as a replacement of the 3D Fourier coefficients to construct an angular power spectrum. And of course, just like for the matter power spectrum, once you get close to the volume limit of your survey, you get into trouble in the sense that it's very hard to uh, okay, so this really should be an ensemble average. However, of course, that's not how we actually do it in practice, right? We have one universe to measure from. We measure the ALM coefficients in this given realization. And then we use statistical isotropy, just like for the matter power spectrum, to average over M values, meaning we average over orientations of the system. And then we get some approximate angular power spectrum doing this trick. But for small L values, meaning large scales, we have very few M values to average over. So we get the sample variance problem. And for 3D power spectrum, typically what you can do in order to alleviate this is just go deeper, measure a bigger volume. But of course, the sphere has finite volume, so there's no way you can do this. And therefore, we have forever to live with this problem that if we get to very large scales, there's an inherent uncertainty in our measurement that we cannot beat ever, unless we wait uh, another 100 billion years or so. Okay, so we take this uh, full sky measurement, 
and we convert it into something that would look like this. So this is from the WMAP data. And what we see is this gray band over here, that's exactly the sample variance I was talking about. We have an inherent uncertainty on small scales, but if we go to larger, uh, larger L, meaning, uh, so small L, I mean over here, if we go to larger L or smaller physical scales, then we can measure at great precision. And we see all these acoustic oscillation imprints. And for uh, Planck, of course, it's much better. And, and really, I mean, it, is, it speaks for itself, I think. It's so astoundingly impressive, this, uh, this picture. And we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven peaks well measured out in the CMB. And as we'll see in a minute, that comes from baryon photon acoustic oscillations in the early universe. So just in order to understand how neutrinos impact this, just very briefly, how do you actually arrive at the CMB spectrum? So first of all, of course, you have to, again, like we discussed many times, understand how do photons interact in the universe at low energy. By far, the main scattering mechanism is just Thomson scattering, which is isoenergetic at these small energies. So it's an energy conserving, but momentum changing interaction. So it can uh, mediate pressure waves, for example, but you cannot change the shape of the photon distribution because you cannot change the energy of the photons. Okay, you calculate the Thomson scattering cross section, you calculate the gamma, and then you compare it to H, completely standard. We've done this several times before. Then you find out that as the universe cools off, of course, simultaneously, you also have protons and electrons recombining to form neutral hydrogen that tremendously drops the cross section because you have many fewer free electrons or drop the interaction rate. And you see that they cross here at a redshift of around 1,000. So prior to a redshift of 1,000, photons are in scattering equilibrium. They're actually not in full thermal equilibrium because you cannot change the number of photons. You cannot change the energy of photons, but you can change this momentum direction of photons. And then afterwards, photons are free streaming particles, and that means we can go out and measure the CMB that was released, not created, but released from uh, the baryons at a redshift of around 1,000. And why do we see oscillations? Well, we know for a fact, and I've shown you this yesterday, we know for a fact that there are small perturbations in the density early on in the universe, presumably created from quantum fluctuations in the inflaton field and then carried over to metric fluctuations, which will leave an imprint on on stuff in the universe. And if you think about photons, there are three effects mainly that you have to worry about, namely the fact that a photon that's emitted from a high density region, well, that comes out with inherently higher temperature than other photons. On the other hand, it's also redshifted gravitationally as it moves out of the potential, these two effects combine. Actually, this effect turns out to be bigger than the other one. So a high density region shows up as a low temperature spot on the sky. Then you also have to worry about the emitting surface moving. So you have a special relativistic Doppler effect that you have to take into account. And you put all of these things together and you solve basically the system of Boltzmann equations that I showed you yesterday, but for photons, including interactions and everything. And uh, it's doable numerically in a few seconds, even on a laptop. So it's not that, uh, that nasty. However, the code that you need to write in order to do it precisely it takes a long time to write. Uh, in the end, what you get out is something that looks like the red curve here. And you see it's a composite, for example, of the green part, which is the potential part plus the density part is what is known as the Sachs-Wolf uh, effect. Then we have the red part, which is exactly anti-correlated. Uh, that's the Doppler effect. And that's not very surprising, of course, if you have an acoustic oscillation. Imagine you have something that expands and contracts. And of course, if it's at maximum expansion or maximum contraction, it doesn't move. And therefore, at the top of these peaks, you have no red contribution because the Doppler effect, again, is out of phase. We can also understand that we have only 
acoustic oscillations when you are on small scales. And the reason for that is that pressure waves are causal. And that means that only inside the causal horizon can you have a sustained pressure wave. Outside the horizon, the only thing that happens is that the metric evolves, nothing else. And then you can calculate, just like we did for the matter power, or I claimed for the matter power spectrum, you get this peak sitting at what corresponds to the horizon at matter radiation equality. Here we have a divide, dividing line that corresponds basically to not the causal horizon, but the sound horizon at the time where photons decouple. And everything to the right is stuff that was inside the horizon prior to photon decoupling. Everything to the left was outside and therefore not subject to acoustic oscillations. And that's why you get these two regimes, one to the left, where you have more or less a flat spectrum. That's just the metric. And to the right, where you have very many complicated features. There's also an additional thing that you have to take into account. And that is the fact that when you look at photons, of course, they are not infinitely tightly coupled and then instantaneously set free. It's a gradual process. And that means that you have the smearing of fluctuations over basically what you would call a random walk scale for the photons that keeps increasing in size. And that leads to the effect that fluctuations on very small scales are dampened out simply because of, of this mixing of, uh, of regions. And therefore, if you go beyond L of a few thousand, uh, the CMB spectrum dies out and you're left with just secondary anisotropies that come from the late time universe. And that also means that Planck has done as well as we ever will when it comes to temperature fluctuations in the CMB. There's nothing more to say about it. It's just there. Uh, when we get to polarization of the CMB, it's a different story, and there's still stuff to uh, to do for the future. Okay, so you can use the CMB. I won't go into any details. The point is you can use the CMB, of course, to probe a variety of cosmological parameters, like, for example, the curvature. You can measure very precisely, but many other parameters as well. And that brings us to neutrinos. So how do neutrinos affect, or say, neutrino mass affect the CMB? Well, at first sight, uh, not very much, actually, unfortunately. And then you might wonder, why is that the case? Well, the case is that neutrinos have low mass fraction of an electron volt. The CMB is created at a temperature of about 0.3 electron volts. That means neutrinos are ultra relativistic particles at this time. So you cannot distinguish a point, say, one electron volt neutrino from a zero electron volt neutrino at the time where the CMB is actually uh, formed or released. You do get small effects, like, for example, something known as the early integrated Sachs Wolf effect the fact that the energy content of the universe is slightly different if you have a massive neutrino, leads to a slight effect. Uh, around this first acoustic peak. But more importantly, what we see in the CMB, of course, is not what is created. We see photons that have propagated through the universe down to us. And that means that just like everything else, these photon paths are subject to gravitational lensing. And that effect is really, really big if you have neutrinos, because as you've seen before, the matter power spectrum is changed radically by the presence of neutrinos. That means gravitational lensing is changed radically. And that gives you a quite significant sensitivity if you use the CMB. But it's not the primary CMB, it's the, so to speak, secondary effect on the CMB. Okay, I think that's it. Then uh, now the video, now we have to see it because uh, you spent so much time exactly. getting it to work. So I guess we have to see it now. And then we switch to the other slides. Yes, once we're done with the film. Yeah. So, uh, I have to go to full screen or something. Perfect. Excellent. OK, so uh, all my many words are condensed, basically, in this uh, simple little film. So here you see the CMB spectrum and the matter, oops, matter power spectrum as a function of changing neutrino mass. And all you need to worry about basically is the fact that 
if you look at the CMB spectrum, it hardly changes at all. This is the primary CMB spectrum. The secondary gravitationally lensed one does change a little bit, but it would actually be really hard to see by naked eye. On the other hand, the matter power spectrum changes very drastically. So by far, this is the most sensitive region to neutrino mass. Okay, that's it. Then we move on to how can we actually use this to constrain neutrino mass? Yes. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on the difference between the actual CMB and the gravitational lens CMB? Yes. Like, yes. Can we can only ever observe the gravitational lens one. So this is just a computational thing. What happens because of gravitational lensing is basically smearing of power. So if you take the primary spectrum, you make the tops a little bit lower and the bottoms a little bit higher. That, that's basically the effect of gravitational lensing. Uh, the lensing effect is well measured in the CMB at something like 25 sigma. Uh, but the effect of neutrinos uh, has not yet, or, or of neutrino mass has not yet been seen. Yeah, sure. I think then it was, it was also problem to show this on um, Zoom, but uh, for those people on Zoom, you can download the video and I have a link. Yeah, there's some scaling issue. Am I good to go? Yeah. Okay. So let's just uh, move on. This is stuff that you've seen already. Let's uh, just very quickly skip through that. The only thing I just want to remind people of is that when we talk about structure formation, there's absolutely no sensitivity to flavor whatsoever. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the cosmic neutrino background, it has, by the time all of this goes down, completely decohered. So the only thing that's around in the universe are pure mass states floating around. Then no such thing as flavor in that sense. Uh, and therefore, the only thing that we care about is the mass of the neutrino. So we have three mass eigenstates, and that's essentially all we need to know in the standard model. Then, of course, it, it's important whether it's the normal or the inverted hierarchy. And more importantly, it's important what is the normalization scale here. So how do you shift this neutrino mass scale up or down? That's what's important. And that means you can basically you know, write everything more or less in terms of just the sum of neutrino masses, because that's what in the end goes into the stress energy tensor that neutrinos contribute to whatever goes on in the universe. And we can plot that, for example, as the function of the lightest eigenstate, either M1 or M3, depending on whether you're in normal or inverted hierarchy. So this is sort of well known, I guess. And if you compare it to something, then Katrin, for example, would be the thing to compare it up against. And let me just remind you that the current Katrin limit on the effective electron neutrino mass is of order one electron volt. And if you convert that to a sum of neutrino masses, we're talking something in the order of two and a half, three electron volts, right? So that's what experimental physics can do at the moment. And we know, of course, this is stuff that I've covered as well, that neutrinos contribute to the dark matter and therefore they have an effect on structure formation. And we've seen cosmological data. Let's just, oops. We're waiting. Well, I mean, something will presumably happen at some point, right? Okay, something will happen. Okay. You... Yeah, let's just skip ahead. Okay, so this is uh, where I wanted to get to more or less. So how well can we do in terms of constraining the neutrino mass from cosmology at the present day? Here you see, for example, a figure from the latest and final data released from the Planck satellite. So what you see here is a two-dimensional posterior for the neutrino mass on the horizontal axis and the Hubble parameter on the vertical axis. 
And Planck itself gives you roughly this contour here. So you can see that the sum of neutrino masses just from CMB data alone is constrained to be just a fraction of an electron volt, something like 0.25 electron volts or thereabouts, which is really impressive. And I should also say that this is from pure CMB. So there are not that many systematic issues possible in this data. But of course, the problem might rather be in the modeling in the sense that this is a very simple cosmological model. And we don't know whether the lambda CDM model is actually a correct model describing the actual universe. We just know that it's a good fit to all observational data. But since we don't know what dark matter and dark energy even are, we cannot be sure. So there's always this caveat. Now, if we include baryon acoustic oscillations, which is basically just the matter power spectrum I showed you before, it's taking the oscillatory part of the matter power spectrum and looking at that specifically, that brings you down to something like 0.1 electron volt for the sum of neutrino masses, which is actually quite intriguing, right? Because that's right around the point where we should start to see a neutrino mass, even in the most pessimistic possible scenario, the sum of neutrino masses is about a 0.06 electron volts. So we're getting very close to more or less a guaranteed detection. Okay, so that's just uh, one particular, uh, sorry. Okay, this should put a box around it. For some reason, it doesn't. Uh, in any case, never mind. The only thing is that this is one particular data analysis paper. There are hundreds in the literature. This is the sum of neutrino masses. Here it's calculated both in the normal hierarchy, the inverted hierarchy, and what is known as the degenerate hierarchy, which of course is not uh, a hierarchy at all. It's just assuming that all neutrino masses are equal. You get more or less the same result. And this would be true almost no matter uh, what type of data I put in. So this is, uh, I think, a figure which is uh, good as an illustration. And it pertains to all types of cosmological data analysis. So what you do is you have a model of some sort, simplest model you can cook up that fits the data, that's lambda CDM. And then you have some data. And depending on your model space and your choice of data, you get some constraint on any given parameter, say, for example, the neutrino mass. This is a slightly old uh, figure, therefore it says 0.7 and not 0.25. It doesn't matter. The argument still holds true. You see, the more data I pile on, of course, the more stringent my constraint becomes, or that constraint turns into a detection. So that's a, that would be very nice. On the other hand, it's also very non-robust. And I can give you tens, if not hundreds, of examples in literature of people claiming to have seen a non-zero neutrino mass from cosmological data. And they always fall into this cuthouse category, right? It's just that you end up with a spurious detection because there's systematics involved. And of course, the, uh, the sort of best of all scenarios in terms of detection is if you take two incompatible data sets and combine them, you get a very, very, very tight constraint, right? Because you're far up a parabola in both cases. So you get a very, very steep likelihood function. And this has happened on, on many occasions. On the other hand, you could also be super pessimistic and say, let's take only the best known data, which would be CMB. And let's allow for the possibility that the cosmological model might be more complicated. And in that case, uh, it might be very robust. On, on the other hand, it takes forever, right? So you're always left to, to walk sort of the rich here in one way or another, depending on how confident you feel about data and the model and so on. So this is just to say that what the game we're playing here is slightly different from, for example, building the Katrin experiment, where there are many, okay, so there are many more ways in which you can control parameters and make independent tests and calibrations. That's just not doable in cosmology because we're left with the, whatever the universe has given us. Okay, so just to give you a few examples of how you how, examples of how you can play around with this mass bound. Say tomorrow, Katrin uh, claims a positive detection of a neutrino mass. Then cosmology would be screwed, right? Because it seems like we're excluding it at many many sigmas. So the question is, how would you then avoid it? So basically, 
what happens if you include a neutrino mass. I've said this many times, but it leads to a modified matter radiation transition. That's what gives you this early integrated sucks wolf effects. If you have neutrino masses, you have much less clustering on small scales. That's a visible effect. So that's what you're up against, right? That's what you have to somehow alleviate in one way or another. So, for example, if you don't fiddle around with the neutrino sector, then you have to somehow build a cosmological model. If you have a large neutrino mass, you need a cosmological model that has more clustering on small scales than lambda CDM because you need to compensate the neutrinos. On the other hand, you could also, and that's perhaps more interesting, at least to this audience, you could play around with neutrino physics and think that maybe neutrino physics is less simple than we thought it was. So in the cosmological category, and there are many, many uh, scenarios in this, uh, in this field, you might, for example, just to take an example, you might play around with the equation of state of dark energy. If we go back something like 20 years, you could actually find a very strong degeneracy between the equation of state parameter of dark energy and the neutrino mass. It's just that if you make the equation of state of dark energy more negative, dark energy becomes important later. And if, if it goes very negative, it's basically yesterday it became important. That means it does not stop structure formation until much later than in standard lambda CDM. That's a good thing from the point of view of neutrinos because that would allow you to have a higher neutrino mass. The problem is that doesn't really work nowadays because data is so precise that this degeneracy has been broken and there's really not very much you can do. It doesn't, uh, doesn't matter what you do. Then you could uh, play around with the neutrino physics. And of course there, the field is uh, much wider so you might uh, want to play with something like, uh, what if the neutrino mass is time varying? So this is an old scenario called the mass varying neutrino. That's one incarnation of it. You might imagine that neutrinos coupled to a light scalar field. Again, it rolls in some potential that leads to a change over cosmological time scales of the neutrino mass. It might become heavier as we approach the present epoch. You could also have models where the neutrino mass is spontaneously generated at some point. So in, in any case, there are many things that you can do. And then you might want to be super pessimistic and say, okay, but let's be very agnostic about it and just say, let's see what kind of constraint does cosmology actually put on the neutrino mass if we think that it's a parameter that's allowed to freely vary over cosmological timescales. So that was uh, played uh, in this very nice paper by Christiane Lawrence and collaborators from a few years ago. So what you can see is if you go out to the CMB timescale, which is a redshift of around a thousand, you actually, you, you are still very constrained about the neutrino mass because of CMB. Then during structure formation, which is essentially here where most of it takes place, Again, you're very constrained. You cannot accept a very large neutrino mass because you wouldn't get enough structure. However, once we get close to the present, the universe doesn't really care much about the neutrino mass whatsoever. The only thing where it would show up would be in gravitational lensing of the CMB. And if you know a little bit about gravitational lensing, the thing is that just like for optical lenses, the effect that you get on the propagation path is maximal if you put the lens right between the observer and the source. And the same is true in gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing of the CMB is strongest for structures that sit in, in physical length scale midway between us and the CMB emitting surface. And that corresponds to a redshift out around three or four. And that means if we go much lower than that, we lose sensitivity again. And if you get very close to the present, you see you could, in fact, have a neutrino mass sort of compatible, more or less, at least, with the Katrin uh, experiment actually detecting something. So that's, uh, of course, super duper optimistic, but still uh, nice to be aware of, I think. Okay, so another thing which has been uh, advertised in the past decade or so as a possible way of getting around some of these things would be to add new interactions to neutrinos so you could have a new Fermi-like 
interaction. So, so the basic standard <laughs> neutrino non-standard interaction, right? You would describe it as a Fermi-like interaction. And this is from one particular uh, analysis where you see is what you see here is this effective coupling constant G effective. So it's basically like the weak interaction. It's just way, way, way stronger than the weak, normal weak interaction. If it was like the normal weak interaction, of course, it would have been seen uh, because it would couple also to electrons, for example. But if you stick it only in the neutrinos, you're allowed to, uh, to do much more. Okay, so this is the standard model out here at very small interactions. However, there seems to be this uh, big strong peak here. So that might be a way of uh, allowing you to have a much larger neutrino mass. Okay, so let's skip on from that. Uh, you could couple it to a new light pseudo scalar. That's another model that has been investigated. And that's actually kind of a neat model in the sense that you get rid of masses in a very, very nice way. If you couple neutrinos to a new light pseudo scalar, like here, for example, you can have pair annihilation into this particle. And if it's massless, then if the interaction is strong enough, as soon as neutrinos go non relativistic, they just vanish off into this new degree of freedom and hopefully leave no imprint on, uh, on structure formation. It's not exactly how it plays out because you, in, in the end, by charging neutrinos under this new interaction, you actually also allow this neutrino pseudoscalar fluid to have acoustic oscillations, for example. So you get all kinds of new weird effects that you then have to take into account. But if you do it correctly, and you charge only some neutrinos, okay, that, there's a lot of tricks you have to play, but the end result is that you can actually have a very large neutrino mass, and you could still allow for a matter power spectrum, which is more or less unchanged, and perhaps interesting to some people, you can in fact also alleviate what is known as the Hubble tension, so you could get a preference for a much larger Hubble parameter than in the standard model. Okay. Yes. Um, now let's let's move on and again uh, try and think a little bit about what what is it actually that we are measuring here. So if say Euclid uh, in two years or so comes out with a result saying now there's a detection of a neutrino mass and that of course could very well be the case and hopefully will be the case maybe not in two years but in in five years. The question is what are we actually measuring? So, of course, we're, we're measuring something that looks like a neutrino. And something that looks like a neutrino is something that contributes to the cosmic energy density in the sense that it has a mass presently and contributed uh, relativistic energy density early. But we cannot, strictly speaking, exclude that we're seeing something else like a light action, for example. That's entirely possible. And as it turns out, it's, it's actually impossible really to, uh, to measure neutrinos directly. And, and the other thing that, uh, that you might worry about or think about is could cosmology actually measure the neutrino hierarchy, right? So we have on the one hand in the normal hierarchy, you have one super light state and then you have two others and, and one slightly heavier and then you have uh, M3 being the heaviest. But you could also have the inverted hierarchy where instead you have two closely separated heavy states and one light state. And that, of course, does not give the same contribution to the stress energy tensor. So it doesn't affect structure formation in exactly the same way. However, as we'll see, okay, this is one uh, particular example. This is just uh, if you had the same energy density, but you turn the fermions into bosons just to play this game, right? How big a difference would it make? to, for example, the matter power spectrum. If you keep the contribution to the current energy density the same and the early time energy density the same, what you see is that you get per mil changes here, way, way, way lower than anything that can be measured. The other thing is the hierarchy. So I'm sorry, it's a little bit smeared here, but this figure, basic, the only thing really you need to see here is that you have numbers very close to one here. That's the only thing that you need to, uh, to worry about because these are changes uh, at various redshifts compared to wh whether you have the normal or the inverted hierarchy. 
And the point is, you get the same effects. You cannot measure how you distribute these neutrino masses. The universe just does not care. The only thing it cares about is how much do I have in total at early times and at late times. How exactly the hierarchy plays out is completely and totally unimportant. And therefore, when people ask you, and I'm very often asked this question by people in the neutrino physics community, can cosmology actually measure the neutrino hierarchy? The answer really is a resounding no, for sure not. But of course, indirectly, yes, cosmology could measure the neutrino hierarchy in the sense that if we are in the situation oops, where, okay, I better, okay. Yeah, okay, like this. Okay, maybe I also point with my hand rather. The point is if the sum of neutrino masses comes out much lower than 0.07 to 0.08 electron volts, then the inverted hierarchy is no longer possible because you cannot squeeze enough mass into, into this in order to be consistent with the mass differences that you get from oscillations. However, if the sum of masses comes out higher than this, then we cannot tell whether it's the inverted hierarchy or the normal hierarchy just with a slightly offset M1, that's not possible. And it's not going to be possible in any foreseeable future, even with the data from Euclid or, or uh, future experiments. So that's that's a no-no. Yes? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. This is normal. Ah, yeah, now, now I remember. It's a... Uh, it's, yeah, it's normalized relative to the, the, the degenerate hierarchy, which of course is unphysical, right? But, uh, but the point is that at all times you get at most per mil level changes. So it's not gonna happen, right? So even with the future data going uh, below a percent in precision is not going to be possible. Okay, so uh, that was all I had to say for now, at least about the neutrino mass. But of course, there are other parameters related to neutrinos, like we talked about yesterday, for example, the number density of neutrinos, or put another way, the contribution of neutrinos to the relativistic energy density at early times and at late times, for that matter. So we know in the standard model exactly what this number is, very precisely even. And however, of course, in beyond standard model, uh, context, it could be anything, right? It could be non-standard neutrino numbers, or it could be additional relativistic light particles. And in cosmology, there's this uh, super weird parameter called N effective, which is really just defined as the actual energy density in whatever you're looking at, typically neutrinos, defined, uh, divided by uh, this benchmark density called rho nu naught, and rho nu naught is just defined like this. And T nu divided by T gamma, that was the 11 divided by four to the one third that we derived on the blackboard yesterday afternoon. Uh, however, that does not, for example, take into account the incomplete neutrino decoupling, the finite temperature QED effects and so on. And as it turns out, the standard model prediction is that this N effective parameter is 3.045, not three. It doesn't mean, of course, there are 3.045 neutrino species. It just means that you're normalizing it against something which uh, is slightly weird. It's just for historical reasons that it's done like this. Okay, if you go back some years, uh, there used to always be some preference for a higher than normal uh, number of neutrino species. So this N effective seemed to be you know, converging on something that looked really interesting and looked like beyond standard model physics in one form or another for many years. So that was uh, quite nice. And people uh, put their faith in the Planck experiment once it uh, got launched, it would actually, you know, confirm that there's something fishy going on. And of course, that's usually not how things play out in the end. The standard model is, as always, pretty strong. So this is the best fit region with our latest data from Planck. It's uh, exactly spot on 3.045 with uh, an uncertainty of about 0.2 or so uh, on either side. So that's boring, 
unfortunately. But on the other hand, it also means that in principle, we can constrain many physics beyond the standard model uh, models using this methodology. Okay, sterile neutrinos, for example. So yeah, I guess the only thing we need here is to, to know that when you hear talk of electron voltage, sterile neutrinos trying to explain LSD and many, many, many other subsequent anomalies, be aware that such neutrinos are completely and totally excluded from a cosmological point of view because they would contribute an effective of roughly one, and that would be excluded at something like seven sigma probably uh, with all current data. But of course, as always, there are caveats. There are ways to work around this. You can uh, charge them with additional new interactions so that you don't have to uh, thermalize them at the same time as the other neutrinos and so on and so forth. So there are many ways one can get around it. But if you just take a sterile neutrino with the only thing added, the mixing and the mass, then that's definitely excluded uh, from cosmology. Okay, so last few minutes uh, of today and of my lectures is a little look towards the future because, of course, it's already, I think, quite impressive what, what cosmology can do in terms of neutrino physics. But we will get lots of new data. You already heard me talk about the Euclid mission. So if you go, for example, to this paper, there are many, of course, studies of what can future CMB and large-scale structure surveys do typically in terms of the neutrino mass and this an effective parameter. Then you see there's, uh, there's this big study from uh, 2013. It's in a, in a big white paper uh, where you see that if you combine Planck, for example, with Euclid, you should be able in this calculation to reach a sensitivity of about 25 milli electron volts. So that should allow you to get a reasonable, significant detection of a non-zero neutrino mass. I think this is maybe even slightly pessimistic. What we can also see is that for some of these different experiments, mainly future CMB experiments, what is called stage four CMB experiments, and these are much better measurements of CMB polarization, should be able to get to this an effective with a precision of 0.02 or thereabouts. And that's actually quite interesting because that's enough to measure, for example, the finite temperature QED effects uh, in the early universe. It's also enough, more or less, to measure additional light degrees of freedom that uh, decouple from equilibrium prior to the QCD phase transition. So that opens the field to a whole range of beyond standard model uh, stuff that can be probed using these experiments. You see here another calculation uh, that I did with uh, Jan Harman and Yvonne Wong uh, a long time ago by now, showing the precision with which you can get at this MU parameter using Euclid uh, as much as possible, plus other galaxy surveys, plus the Planck satellite. And the point again is that you should be able, even in the most pessimistic case, to actually get a detection of a non-zero neutrino mass. Uh, a real detection, not a spurious one, but a real detection, more or less guaranteed from, uh, from what we get from Euclid. And Euclid was successfully launched three weeks ago, so there's, uh, there's hope that this will materialize within the comparatively near future. Okay, you can also measure this in effect if I showed you this already. And then the question is, uh, Will this actually materialize? And the answer is yes, hopefully. But of course, there's a lot of work that needs to go into <clears throat> theoretical modeling of all kinds of things. Like, for example, Euclid will measure the large scale structure power spectrum and the weak lensing power spectrum very precisely. That also means that, of course, from a theory point of view, we have to be able to calculate it just as precisely as you can measure it. And that uh, means if you go to high L in the weak lensing, uh, you have to be able to theoretically control your errors to something like 1%. And that goes also for the matter power spectrum, for example. And that's actually not very simple at all. And you need to take all kinds of effects into account. You need to do big end body simulations with baryonic effects included, uh, hydro simulations. You need to take into account massive neutrinos. A lot of work has gone into this. 
And I can show you examples here of uh, what happens if you study uh, structure formation in, in full nonlinearity. The green curves are basically equivalent to what I showed you already uh, in various incarnations. That's the suppression due to neutrinos because of whatever neutrino mass that's around. But these colored dashed or dotted curves are what you get if you do real n-body simulations of the same thing. And of course, uh, this effect is certainly large enough that it needs to be taken into account properly. So that's something that we've spent uh, years and years actually working on. Uh, there are many papers on this. Uh, all of these calculations now go into the Euclid, uh, the big Euclid simulation. So this is from the so-called flagship galaxy simulation in Euclid. So that's one of the biggest galaxy uh, clustering simulations ever run. So it, of course, it looks uh, quite nice. This is, uh, if you really do everything properly, including all kinds of effects from TR, mind you, an n-body simulation is typically an inherently Newtonian thing and it's quite tricky to do it in, uh, in general relativity because, of course, there are all kinds of things that you need to worry about. As it turns out, you can actually do it by choosing the proper gauge to work in. You can actually make your Newtonian in-body simulations compliant and compatible with general relativity. And then you get curves that look something like this. So that's just to show that uh, work is ongoing. And that brings me to the final slide. And I think, I hope what I've uh, convinced you about or tried to convince you about is that neutrino physics is a super good example of how you can do particle physics using cosmology. And people often talk about, the, say, inflation, for example, probing very high energy physics using cosmological data. This is much more down to earth, right? These are questions that you would typically try and build an experiment to answer but as it turns out, cosmology is also sensitive to such, uh, to such effects like the neutrino mass, for example, the number of neutrino species. And as I've shown you, the bound, for example, on the neutrino mass is really impressive and way, way, way better by more than an order of magnitude compared to what you can do with Catherine, for example. However, of course, you should be aware that it's also much more model dependent and one really shouldn't live without the other. I mean, if we only had cosmology, I don't think even when we came out and claimed a detection at some point, people probably wouldn't believe it too much. But when there is a positive detection from cosmology, that gives us something to shoot for with, uh, with direct detection experiments. As it is now, there's really no hint of non-standard anything in cosmological data. Of course, there are always anomalies like the Hubble tension and so on. But there's no real indication that anything uh, really strange is going on. And new data from Euclid will hopefully at least give us positive detection of neutrino mass. And this is something, the statement I've shown for decades now in talks. And I really hope that within the not too distant future, this will change to Euclid has provided us with evidence for a non for a non-zero neutrino mass. Okay, so that's it. Yep. Thank you, Stan. So, uh, so now that Euclid is launched, how many years do we have to wait for the first results? Do you know? Um, something like a year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. So that's really soon. Okay. So first, it has to go to L two, right, and yeah. then uh, it has to be calibrated, and then mm -hmm. it has to start observing, and it finishes a full sky survey, I think, in about six months. Okay. But. Uh, then again, it takes time. So the first yeah. data release plus uh, accompanying papers, I think probably a year and a half from now. Okay. Yeah, neutrino astronomy, we always think in 10 years or so, but one year, this is... Uh, yeah, but uh, but Euclid was approved for launch in 2011, right? Yeah, so sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, the point is that, that once it's up there, there's nothing more you can do, right? Yeah. Unlike if you build an experiment, you can always tweak you things. You cannot go there. That's, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's not an option here. Yeah. Uh, questions? Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, you show the plots of H naught in uh, in the bounds in the sum of neutrino masses, right? Yes. 
Uh, is there any impact of the Hubble tension in these bounds in the sum no. of neutrino? Well, okay. I mean, if you go back to to the era of W map, actually, what the, what used to be the case was that there was a strong positive correlation between the Hubble parameter and uh, and the sum of neutrino masses. So the ellipse would go something like this. And there, you would actually prefer, if you had a high neutrino mass, you would prefer a larger Hubble parameter. So that's no longer the case because the main bound from CMB comes from lensing. And that induces a negative correlation here. So the higher the neutrino mass, the worse everything gets. Uh, I see. And if you now impose, for example, the shoes prior on the Hubble parameter and force it to be 73, you just end up with two incompatible data sets and you get a very poor fit. I mean, it doesn't do much to the neutrino mass bound. It just makes the fit worse. I see. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. It is. So thank you. Uh, I'm curious about adding a, a sterile neutrino into the standard model. Um, what? Really, what wiggle room is there in terms of parameters? Like, for example, if I can come with an extreme example, let's say we have a GeV scale sterile neutrino, but it has uh, an, a coupling strength of 10 to the negative 9 or, or more. So effectively, its mass might be on the order of GeV. But yeah, it, OK, so, so a GeV sterile neutrino would, if it has any mixing at all, decay very rapidly because the decay is not gym suppressed. So, of course, there are these sterile neutrino dark matter models where you typically have KV sterile neutrinos with small mixings. And they would not affect the ineffective bound. They would also not affect the mass bound that I've shown you because the mass would be so large that the free streaming scale is, is sort of pushed beyond what you can probe in, uh, in most large scale structure surveys. So there might be, and that's a... Uh, a debate that there might be a window where the mass is small enough that the decay is slow enough that you haven't seen it already because the decay is, is photon emitting. So that would be seen as X-ray uh, emission. On the other hand, the mass must not be too small because then the free streaming starts to play a role. And the, there might be a window still in the KV range depending on parameters and so on. GeV neutrinos, uh, surely they are allowed from a cosmological point of view. Go ahead and uh, uh, add as many as you like. Uh, and of course, there are, there are models where such neutrinos play a role, for example, in leptogenesis, for example, in the new MSM, right, and, and such things. Uh, all the stuff that I've shown you would not be sensitive to a GeV sterile neutrino. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? So, I was. I had a question. I was wondering: mm -hmm. Are neutrino oscillations relevant in all these simulations? For example, you had this case of the degenerate hierarchy, which will not have oscillations. No, 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 because at the time of CMB, I mean, you basically have decohered everything. Yeah. So, so that so just mass states. Mass eigens, eigens states exactly. Okay. So, so yeah. flavor never plays a role anywhere in uh, in this game. Yeah. Yeah. In BBN, of course, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unity. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, since no one has another question, I have uh, so the mass vary varying neutrinos. Yes. Uh, so you had this uh, plot showing redshift and the uh, the maximum mass that were allowed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so did I understand correctly? This is not like a model of no. independent neutrino mass. This is just if if for some reason yeah this yeah. One here, at some reason, at redshift 0.1, the neutrino would gain a higher mass that yeah. would be allowed at that level. Yeah, this, this is not uh, from the model building side. Yeah. This is from the agnostic uh, data yeah. side saying that, OK, what does cosmology actually tell us about neutrino masses at this or that yeah. redshift? OK. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's, it's, a, it's a useful exercise because it emphasizes where do we actually get our information yeah. from. And how can you build models, actually? How build, could you, if yeah. you are a model builder yeah. in need uh, of uh, you know, hiding something, yeah. then uh, how do you do it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, is there any observables in cosmological um, um, parameters 
that might indicate the Majorana nature of neutrinos? No, I mean, unfortunately not. Not, not in, uh, in what we've talked about here. And the reason, of course, naively you might think, ah, but direct neutrinos, of course, have uh, four degrees of freedom rather than two. And therefore, what about an effective, for example? But the point is, unless the mass is very large, you never thermalize them in the early universe. They decouple so early that it's way, way, okay, so way beyond the QCD phase transition. And therefore, you would presumably never see them. And maybe if you can go to an ineffective of 0. 0. 0.00 something, then, then it might be possible. Otherwise, unfortunately not. And of course, all the interactions typically have this uh, m squared over e squared uh, uh, suppression of, of the other helicity state. So not, not that I know of, and I don't think uh, anyone has ever convincingly come up with, uh, with anything in that regard. I mean, you might think it would be nice, right? Because the cosmic neutrino background, after all, they are non-relativistic particles. And therefore, you might be able to say something. But uh, unfortunately, direct detection, as you know, of course, is uh, super difficult at best. Yeah. OK. I see no further question. Um, uh, Maurizio, did you check online other questions? No. No? OK. Let's uh, thank Sin again for today and also for the, the lecture series. This was really awesome. And we now go to uh, a coffee break.